Before Pastor Carl comes, I have a very important message for the congregation. To all active members of the First Congregational Church of West Haven, Connecticut, this is a call to the annual meeting of 2020. The 2020 annual meeting of the First Congregational Church of West Haven will be held on Zoom Sunday, February 7, 2021 at 12 o'clock p.m. The purpose of this meeting is to act on the following items of business to receive the annual reports of the pastor, the interim director of Christian education, church officers, church council, all boards and committees, the ushers, delegates, and other organization and groups of the church for the year 2020, to approve revisions to the bylaws, to adopt a budget for the year 2021, to elect officers, board members, committee members, and delegates for the year 2021 and to conduct any other business that may properly come before this meeting. Signed, Ann Fletcher, Church Clerk. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in this day. I'm Pastor Carl, and no matter whom you are on life's journey, we thank you so much for viewing the recording with us this day. We pray that your hearts will be open to receive that all that God will have for you to hear this day will be heard. We pray that you will continually seek our God because our God loves you so much. So we welcome you and we thank you for participating and viewing the recording with us this day. Before we continue, my wife Belinda will once again come up and read the scripture for our sermon and then we'll proceed accordingly. Our scripture reading will be coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, ch uh, verses 11 through 20. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we, also, we, but we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the wor world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, 
we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Our God, we thank you for the hearing of your word, that your word will fall upon the good ground, the good soil of our hearts. Therein, allow your word to grow within us 30, 60, and 100 fold. These things we ask in the name of King Yahshua Jesus. Amen. The sermon titled for this day is What If? 2 Corinthians 5. 11 through 20. Sometime this year, mid-year, around about 2021, sometime to the middle of this year here, Disney Plus will be releasing an animated anthology series titled, What If? The purpose of this series is to explore what will happen and what has happened in major moving movie events, excuse me, from the Marvel Cinematic Universe but offering, looking at them from a different perspective as if something differently occurred than what you're used to seeing. And this got me thinking. You see, as a kid, well before Disney Plus, or Disney, acquired the rights to Marvel and Marvel Comics, they explored a concept in the comics that came back to me as I was thinking about this sermon. And the thing that came to me is that Marvel had this thing titled, What? if the Hulk had the brain of Bruce Banner. Now, the reason for this what-if scenario is that Bruce Banner, Reed Richardson, Charles Xavier constructed a, an improved version of Cerebo called the Psychotron, which merged them physically and mentally into one being, into one X-man. They were forced to use this machine, and they only used it one time because the machine blew up afterwards, but they used it in order to take on the defending the Earth against a pending superpower called Galactus. Now, I realize that many of you don't know anything about these superheroes or Charles Xavier or Reed Richards and so on and so forth, but again, it got me thinking, what if, what if God will allow us to see the world and its people as God sees it. What if indeed? Well, in fact, God does give us the power to see the world and its people as he sees it. And we don't need Cerebo or the Psychotron in order to do this. See, God has already provided us with the means of how to be doing this, and it is through the Holy Spirit. In our seeking to understand this from God's word, it is unfortunate that many of our modern translations have knowingly or unknowingly skewed the clarity in their translations. You see, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 and 16, which commonly is read, for now on, Therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. If you think about that, something's missing. See, as clear as that sound, something is missing. See, the scripture, when we read it in a non-contemporary version or non-modern translation of the Bible, Reading it, we get a different feel for it, and it says the following. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5 and 16. Again, with regards, we know no one according to their flesh. So we, as we consider this, we need to ask ourselves, what was God attempting to have us to understand? What was God trying to convey to us? And the answer is simple. God was trying to get us to understand that as we engage each other as Christians, instead of us focusing on others' faults and their failures, that we should look to see them as God see them, as regenerated spirits that happen to be living in ungenerated 
bodies. See, we know the answer to what I just told you is correct because when we get down to the 21st verse, it says that we might become the righteousness of God. See, becoming the righteousness of God can only occur for those whose spirits have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And it's because our spirits are regenerated by the Holy Spirit, it gives us the ability to do great things because our spirit is made alive and as our spirit is made alive, we're able to connect with other Christians in the purity of our faith as kindred spirits. But knowing people by their spirits only and how we should live our lives in doing this right here can only occur as we walk in the spirit, as we talk in the spirit, as we engage life and all that is around us through our regenerated, our recreated spirit. And this can only occur through the power of the Holy Spirit that has been sent to us by Christ Jesus himself who has redeemed us. For one, those who want more clarity on this point, please see John the 14th chapter, specifically the 17th verse. Now, as we attempt to engage and connect with each other spiritually, I must be clear here, I need to be 100% absolutely clear with no ambiguity that our experience with each other and our experiences with God cannot, must not be mystical nor metaphysical. Again, to be clear, we are not seeking to engage each other and God mystically, which is defined as some mystical union or direct communion with ultimate reality that is promoted by mystics on the belief that direct knowledge of God or spiritual truth or the ultimate reality can be attained through our subjective experiences or through our intuition, or through our own insight. Nor are we seeking to engage God or each other metaphysically, where we are trying to examine the fundamentals of nature and reality, including our relationship with mind and matter, between substance and attributes, between the potentiality and actuality, See, Christians are not supposed to try to connect with experiences beyond their lived existence. We are not supposed to try to attempt to connect with our physical world through our spiritual capabilities. We are not supposed to try to use this connection because in using that connection, what is not understood by many of us, that it becomes occultic. Please see Philippians 4 and 7. See, as we desire to live our lives as faithful Christians and to the glory of God, we should and we must be careful about how we seek to engage our lives despite the fact of the potential of doing it the wrong way. Hear me. God has provided us a way that we can connect with each other in the purity of of our faith, and we do not have to use mystical or metaphysical means in order to do that. The Bible is clear that God's word is a lamp to our feet and is a light to our path. Otherwise, God can direct us how we can connect with one another. Please see Psalms 119, 105. See, this is the tragic when pastors and leaders who are willing to allow their faith to be shaken and destroyed by Ivy Leaguers and other intellectual elites in our seminaries who seek to dissuade us from embracing the word of God as truth. I've seen, sadly, these dastards in action. I've seen firsthand how they have clouded 
They have made obscure the word of God, how the clarity of our faith, substituting God's word for humanistic, secular, metaphysical, and mystical teachings, trying to merge these things into the word of God, trying to do something because they're unwilling to allow the word of God to speak for itself. For those who do these things, the Bible declares a woe unto them. The Bible says, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight, Isaiah 5 and 21. See, what we don't understand, and this is not clearly communicated to us in our modern vernacular, is that the word woe is a very powerful warning from God. God is telling us that it is a condition of deep suffering and misfortune when those who do these type of things, it can ruin them. It causes calamity in their lives. God goes as far as to say that claiming themselves to be wise, they become fools, Romans 1 and 22. See, it's troublesome when we can't look to the word of God to inspire us. That we can't look to the word of God to help us in our faith because these translations, the way they are promoted, the way they are given out, that they're done in such a capacity that I don't know if it's knowingly or unknowingly that it's done, but it's hindering us as Christians. And this is why we must understand the fact that if we're going to work and be with each other, we have to get back to the basics of our faith so we can know how we should go about to live with each other. To encourage everyone, please hear me. The scripture says that all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for the training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3. 16 and 17. See, this is why I encourage every new believer, every new Christian, or those that are in the faith who really desire to know more about God's word, is to review these, the word of God in the non-modern translations. And as you get familiar with the non-modern translations, then look at the newer translations for context in the conversation. So going back to my original statement, I went all the way around there to get to this point here. To highlight the issue today, knowing someone in the flesh and knowing them from a human experience, there is something that's missing because we are not able to connect with the subject that's being communicated when we're saying knowing you from the human perspective. The flesh as defined by the Bible, clearly means that you are not in Christ. But looking at it from the perspective of human perspective, it leaves too much room for ambiguity. What does that really mean? So this is what I'm trying to get us to focus on here. And I can assure you, as we continue on with this, we're going to get more into this issue regarding flesh and human understanding or looking at things from a human point of view so we can get a fuller picture of how we are to engage each other as Christian men and women. See, the dichotomy of these two, the flesh and the human point of view, this is the essence of what makes us to be Christian men and women. And it's not metaphysical and it's not mystical and again, we will explore this subject further next week. God bless you. Grace and peace. Amen.